Welcome to the Near Dachuan Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamens. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week we finish our discussion on Zhang Xiaodong, uh, which includes a little discussion about his student Han Musha and the famous fight he had with the Russian strongman. We look at a couple different versions of the story, first from C.S. Tang's book and then from the Bagua Journal, just to give some different perspectives on the, <clears throat> the incident. Uh, then we wrap it up with a short discussion on Han Musha and Zhang Xiaodong's relationship and how it uh, devolved near the end of Zhang's life. Also, out now on the Patreon, we have the second part of our interview with Mary Christensen. We're going to have uh, a special episode on Liu Hongjie's Buddhist teacher coming up pretty soon as well as the Shingi practice session and a whole bunch of other stuff. So give that a listen. All right, on to the episode. Hope you enjoy it and take care. Welcome to the Nei Chuan podcast with Isaac and Jess. So following Master Zhao's article here, he's got a, a few last, his last statement that I'll get into is... Uh, it, and so the interviewer says, well, if you're critiquing Chinese martial arts in general, what about specific styles? Let's start with Xing Yi Chuan. And Master Zhao says, in the 1920s and 30s, there were many representatives of Xing Yi among the winners of the Lei Tai tournaments. He says, but today the power of Xing Yi Chuan has decreased. The reason is that apart from problems common to all Chinese martial arts, this one Xing Yi stresses harmony, unity, as many, and it has many aspects where there's a lack of such harmony. For instance, there's a lack of harmony between techniques and force. In Xing Yi, hitting technique is powered by pushing force. Fists or palms mainly push the opponent in small part, only causing a small amount of damage, but it doesn't allow the pushing the opponent far away in pushing hands. Actually, it seems as if Xing Yi people have not decided whether their technique is for Sancho or for Tui Shou. So Sancho means free fighting, Tui Shou means push hands. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that, that Xing Yi technique has devolved a little bit to where you're just using pushing force instead of real hard striking force. So basically, right. people aren't punching hard enough anymore. Is what he's well, I think what he's kind of saying is that they're adapting Xingyi to a more civil kind of... People well, are becoming too nice. Doing it more like push hands, essentially, mm -hmm. right? So in, instead of it being about, um, you know, like as Bruce would say, the smash and bash, which is what Xingyi is really good at. Um, they've made it about sensitivity and, you know, and, and more like a Tai Chi kind of practice. And, right. um, you know, there are elements Isn't of a that bad thing. Yeah. No, there are elements of that in Shingy, but if you want to get the fighting part of Shingy, you have to practice that part of it. I mean, one of the things that was always drilled into me when, you know, doing the different, you know, if you're doing Tai Chi, Shingy and Bagua, right. So you have to make a different, you know, like do them differently because you're, not doing the same thing in three different containers you're doing three different things and and so the mind of a shingy person has to be a shingy person the mind of a you know you can't kind of do the movements of Xing, i mean you can but then it's not the real thing and it doesn't work as well but do the shingy movements with tai chi on the inside right so you know when you fight, you can mix them up any way you want. But when you practice them, you have to be able to differentiate what the hell am I doing, right? And Xingyi techniques aren't the same as Tai Chi techniques. And so, you know, the power that you have to develop in Xingyi is unique to Xingyi and you got to work on it. Just like if you want to develop the Tower of Tai Chi, you got to work on that one. And, <clears throat> you know, it's like they aren't in mutually or they aren't interchangeable there are different things for a reason so he ends by talking about how you know xing yi the name means form and intention e meaning intention using your mind and then harmony is the word xing um and he's criticizing it saying um there's a lack of harmony between the form and intention all this talking about form and intention is important but there's a lack of harmony between the fighting methods and the exercises so he's he's using the word xing yi to critique xing yi's fact that people aren't using the actual techniques the the thing i would say about that is there's a, a lack of internal cohesion in a lot of people when they do shingy so that i think what he's saying is that they're 
physical movement isn't linked to anything and so there is you know so you, they might look like they're doing it but if you actually press on them there's nothing really there and that the thing that makes shingy shingy is that you develop this internal physical connection that comes from years and years of standing on one leg and developing these postures that uh you get strong in a way that you just don't get strong doing many other things and and it takes a long time to get it like probably 10 20 years to get it but uh that once you have it your movements have a very different quality uh, that's that e you're talking about that continuous awareness well, of shing yi it's a combination of e and the physicality right it's, it's where it's where when your mind tells your body to do something is there a gap and then when your body does it, does it actually do the thing you wanted it to do or does it do something else? And, you know, the biggest one that like you sort of start with in Xing Yi is throw your hand up in the air and you make a punch and you just have the intent of I want this to land on my center line. And you close your eyes and you throw that punch and you open your eyes and you see if that punch actually landed on your center line. And about 90% of the people, when they first do it, they don't. They land somewhere off to the side. That's a disconnect between your mind saying, I want to do this, and your body saying, uh, "That fuck no, we're not going to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, you just kind of have to work. That's the, that's the practice is working out that disconnect. And returning back to Bagua Journal, there's a few last little things that I'd uh, like to mention about Master Zong. Um, it says here, the majority of martial arts students studying in Tianjin in the early part of the century, of the 20th century, were either students of Zhang Zhaodong or Li Tsunyi. So he's saying they were the two biggest guys in Tianjin, period. You know, these were, that's why their names come around so much. They ran a very well-known martial arts association in Tianjin, and all boxers knew of their efforts to spread the martial arts. Um, and so in terms of his class, in Tianjin, Zhang taught private students, and he taught a public class once a week. Students in the public class could study either Bagua or Xing Yi, whatever they preferred. Zhang required his private students and inner door students to study Xing Yi before they studied Bagua. Um, and it said later in life, since he was one of the last remaining students of Dong Hai Chuan, he switched entirely to teaching Bagua. But that, that is an interesting statement because, you know, the way we learned, Xing Yi does come before Bagua. You've got to learn that knockout power first before you start spinning around on the circle. There, there's a heavy back and forth in terms of the influence of Xing Yi and Bagua on each other. And um, just depending on the individual, it's like, you might get more, you might get less. Mm. And I think, you know, for example, uh, Li Zhen Yi and Zhang Zhaodong both did Xing Yi and they both did Bagua, right? But Li Zhen Yi almost exclusively referred to himself as a Xing Yi guy. And never really made that switch to, you know, I'm a Bagua teacher, even though he did teach people Bagua. And, you know, Zhang Zhaodong clearly at some point said, you know, there are enough Xing Yi people out there doing my, you know, doing this lineage or whatever, that I want to focus on the part that I feel is more in danger of sort of disappearing, right? And he made that shift to, as you get older, you can kind of fold your Xing Yi into your Bagua because Bagua has a more mm -hmm. uh, larger repertoire of movements already. So yeah, basically, yeah. So There's just of, more to do in Bagua. Yeah, so you can sort of fit most of that in there um, and saves you time more, more than anything else, right? Right, you know, you're naturally going to yeah. slow down a bit. It says here in one more paragraph, since Zhang Zhaodong was a Xing Yi man, his Bagua naturally had a Xing Yi flavor. There he was also a big man and very strong. He liked to use very wide, open postures in training and liked to strike down on his smaller opponents when fighting. His Bagua form and application were very direct and relatively simple compared to others. Because Zhang was bigger and stronger than most of his opponents, his Bagua technique was not as evasive as Yin Fu's. And because of his Xing Yi background, he did not utilize as many throwing techniques as someone like Cheng Tinghua, mm. who had come from Shui Zhao. Due to his size and background, his Bagua Zhang technique was very direct and powerful. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I mean. Yeah. And, and they list him with the students of Dong Ai Chuan, you know, because technically he is yeah. an equal to Yin Fu or Cheng Ting Hua. But yeah. he had his own little, little more stripped down approach, I think. Yeah. All his life, Zhang Zhaodong was strict on martial arts discipline and martial virtue. 
He practiced martial arts as if he was following some kind of religious way. He said that one had to be very sincere in their heart in order to practice. Zhang had four rules for accepting students. He said that he would not take students who practice the art without respecting the art. The second was that he would not teach people who took advantage of others. Also, if the student was not respectful towards his parents, he wouldn't accept them. And lastly, he would not accept people who were innately bad with a bad nature because they would use the art in a bad way. So, you know, he's a man of virtue. He's a man of the people. He's, he's a, he brings together people from different groups and he goes on the stage to fight foreigners and win. So this guy's checking all the boxes, basically. It's that, that emphasis on, you know, being a fighter, but also having a element of morality to it. Yeah. You're a gentleman, you know, and I think there's something about these internal martial arts, especially because they were practiced by like the student Zhao says by there were literati involved i think there's you you internal martial arts often have that sense of we're we're an upright group of good people who are doing this for the people to serve the people you know there's it's not like a village martial art maybe where there's just that's just well not really talked about there's something noble about tai chi yeah i mean i think it i think it ultimately comes down to what's the point of knowing how to fight if you i mean like what's the what's the purpose of it right you could take sort of a zhuangzi approach zhuangzi approach to it like you know there has to be a what's its usefulness right because mm. at a certain point right once you know how to fight it's like well now what right like do you gonna teach other people how to do it you're gonna just go randomly beat up bad guys out in the street you know like batman or like i mean like so there's kind of this thing of of you know what do you do with that skill and i struggle with that myself sometimes right. i mean it's, it's part of your process like, like what, what, what are we doing this for right so that's where i think the internal arts have that other side of it where uh you use it as a health as a quote, quote unquote spiritual practice because it's like at a certain point just beating the crap out of people kind of gets boring and it's like well i like doing this but i'd like to get something more than just you know the gratification of being bigger and stronger than someone else from it and i think you know there's a lot to be said for that especially if you're gonna be a functioning member of society right today we're gonna talk about a martial arts master called han Musha. Han Muxia started studying martial arts as a child, and in his teens, he was accepted as a disciple of Lightning Hands, Zhang Zhaodong. We've talked about him a couple of times on the podcast, with his famous fight with the Russian strongman that is at the center of a lot of martial arts stories. His story intersects with Liu Hung Jie's in that Liu's teacher was part of the traveling group that went to see the big fight. And so we've speculated that maybe even Liu got to go on that trip, or at least he heard about it from his friends probably the biggest thing happening so why wouldn't you go check oh, it out good. You know? right i mean so let's start by looking at uh, a few paragraphs from han Musha's life story from the book shin tian baguajang by master c.s tang uh published last year the legend of master han Musha, the strange hero of the martial arts world so it says here that uh during the late Qing dynasty when the country was invaded by foreign powers and the strong were bullying the weak traditional martial arts were tested among others, Han Muxia courageously stepped forward to fight for righteousness and defeated strongmen from Russia, Germany, and England, winning back pride for his country and demonstrating the value of Chinese martial arts. And it says, furthermore, he later became a disciple of the head instructor of the Yihei group, the Xingyi master, single saber Li, Li Yi. After he learned this art, he worked for the Tianjin police force for over 10 years. He often solved complicated cases and was well known for keeping the peace and his prominent contributions to policing. So it sounds like Master Han here was also a thief catcher, just like his teacher, Zhang Zhaodong. And was maybe that's where he met Zhang at the police force um, there in Tianjin. In the last episode, we talked about how uh, Zhang Zhaodong brought two guys with him to fight 30, 30 people. 30 gangsters Han, with the whip, yeah. Right. Han was one of those two guys, right? right? As his sort of right-hand man. Han sincerely respected and delighted in the techniques of Baguazhang and pursued his studies to the point of intoxication. The idea of being intoxicated by it is a nice way of putting it. Because you know how people will catch like the Bagua bug and just like, you yeah. just can't stop thinking about it and doing it, you know? Well, and it sounds like, you know, he was a accomplished Xingyi guy and then he, you know, found Bagua and got really into right. it as well. So it says here he researched where master dong Chuan had learned although he remained tight-lipped 
and he uh, he somehow figured out that he had learned in Snowflower Mountain. So Han Musha searched hard and finally found a Taoist up there at Snowflower Mountain. The Taoist mm. appreciated his efforts and passed on the true principles of Baguazhang to him, including the pre-heaven palms and the dragon form piercing method and the snake form continuous and trapping 64 post-heaven palms. Wow. After Han had received the teaching from this system, he changed his name to Musha, appreciating chivalry so that he would never forget his teacher. He combined both the southern and northern streams of Baguazhang, plus the principles of Xing Chen, into one system. He returned to Tianjin to share his teachings and in 1912 set up the Chinese Martial Arts Association. In, it sounds like in Tianjin. Okay, so 1912. So this is the sister school of the esteeming the Marshall Society right, so in this, Beijing. Right. So there's the Beijing one is the esteeming the Marshall Society. The Tianjin is the Warriors Association, sometimes called the Chinese Martial Arts Association. So he returned to Tianjin to share the teachings and in 1912 set up the Chinese Martial Arts Association. Han was influenced by the idea of openness in his teachings and built the Han, the Han family nine teacher hall to commemorate his nine teachers. In the 1920s, he served as the martial arts instructor to the Northeast Army. He set up a large saber unit instructed in the use of Xing Yi spear, which had remarkable success during the war of resistance against the Japanese at the Great Wall. So it sounds wow. like he's involved in the 1930s in the war against Japan. Yeah. Well, they were all, I think, military guys. I mean, most of the guys we've talked about have a connection to that military yeah. time period, including Leo Hung Jae serves in the Nationalist Army as well. Um, then we move forward to, uh, or we move back to 1918. In Beijing, during the contest of 10,000 nations, Han defeated a Russian strongman, Kang Tai Er, who called himself the strongest man in the world. This book, this is the famous, uh, this is fight, the famous right? fight. Okay, so now let's get into the fight a little closer. Now, we've kind of set the stage for the fight in the sense that we've talked about all the people that were there and how this sort of culturally was a somewhat important moment for Chinese martial arts and being a foreigner. Yeah, yeah. But now let's get into the blow by blow here. So it says that, uh, that this Russian strongman organized a martial arts convention in the Central Park in Beijing and prepared 11 gold medals for the various competitions. Han Wuxia, his teacher, Zhang Zhaodong and Li Tsunyi rushed to the Grand Hotel de Wagon Li in Beijing to fight with Kang Tai Er. In the fight, Han used the advancing thrusting and crushing motion and the five dragon waist and trapping palm to knock Kang Tai Er over. Kang Tai Er wrote a letter to Li Tsunyi indicating defeat and presented all the gold medals to Han Wuxia. This event rocked the martial arts world. So that's his one paragraph description of it. So now we're going to turn to the uh, Bagua Journal of 1993's uh, September issue and look a little bit at some of the other accounts of the fight. So it says here that uh, in all famous boxing stories from the old days, there's a number of different versions of the fight, which have been handed down orally and in written accounts. One of the stories states that when Han and the Russian went to fight, the Russian tried to punch him in the throat. Han used uprising palm and blocked the strike. The Russian grabbed his wrist. But as he grabbed it, his hand was up in the air, and thus his right side was exposed. Han Musha used Bai Bu swinging step to step in and hit the Russian in the ribs with his palm. The Russian, who was very tall, fell over like a wall had been knocked down. He rolled over and vomited all over the ground and didn't get up. Han Musha was the winner. So he used a Bagua leg swinging technique and strike to the body. Now, there's another version of the fight in the Beijing newspapers that said... Uh, the tournament officials had tried to refuse to let them fight with the Russian, so they went to his hotel and got a big argument with him in his hotel room. The Russian and Han Musha jumped up and started fighting. Han used the, hit the Russian using Xing Yi's tiger form and knocked him 10 feet away. So that in this book, this, this newspaper saying she used Xing Yi, not Ba Gua, and with the tiger form and sort of two peach one at the same time where you blast him with a double shot right. to smash him back. Um, it says another one is uh, that the fight was supposed to take place in the park. However, the actual fight ended up at the hotel. He said after Han hit the Russian and the Russian fell down, Han went over and stomped on him to keep him down. And that's when he started vomiting. So that, confer <laughs> that confirms what happened with the vomit. And so a lot of the stories also talk about how the Russian guy went to the Martial Arts Association in Tianjin and wanted to make friends with Han Musha. Uh, but when he got there, he was told he shouldn't show up because Han wanted to beat him to death. The Russian said that he admitted defeat, so there's no reason for them to be enemies. This story was published in a Chinese martial arts book, which told of the fight and had pictures. 
Ah, wow, I haven't seen this, this book before. Yeah. I hope we can run across that one sometime. Get some more details. I mean, Han Wuxia was, he was in his mid-40s, I think, at this time. Well, so. if it's 1918 and he's born in uh, 1877, that's, yeah, it's 40, 41 years old. So he's clearly at the height of his powers at that point. That's that's impressive, you know, to be beating the stuff <laughs> out of somebody like that at forty. Right? He's, he's still keeping it keeping it going. Yeah. Um, so just to wrap up everything about the fight, uh, a letter written by Kang Chir and printed in a Russian newspaper said that he didn't think he would run into anyone as strong as Han Musha. He said Han ran over him like an iron ball on an iron track. He admitted that he had a lot of admiration and respect for Chinese martial arts. Um, so there, there you go. After the fight, because Zhang had restored the honor of the Chinese by setting up this fight, he became well-loved by the Chinese, and his student Han Musha became famous. The Chinese government gave Han Musha a gold medal and plaque. Hmm. So there's, for some reason, this particular one just made this huge splash, maybe because it was so publicized, or maybe Zhang Zhaodong's reputation was so good that uh, for whatever reason, uh, it just really caught the, the public eye, you know? Like, it just, everyone fell in love well, with this guy. there was a time when, you know, beating up a foreigner was the thing to do if you could, you know, as a martial artist. So if you could find one in, a, like, a high-profile guy like this especially, that catapults you to a whole other level of fame, if you will. Han Musha and Zhang Zadong had a falling out late in Zhang's life, after which Han modified his Bagua and started claiming that much of his Bagua came from a Taoist. The story of the falling out between Zhang and Han Musha was told by Professor Kang Wu. Sounds like a classic sort of situations where uh, if you get mad at your teacher, you don't want to say that he, you learned it from him, but you don't got to say you learned it from somebody. So. And maybe this there was a Taoist guy. I mean, it's... Once you've gotten your basis from your first teacher, you're never. There are lots be of Dallas guys, I'm right? sure. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I mean, so again, it's the example of you learning from one guy, but then you go to someone else who gives you some polishing tips or some, some I don't know, philosophy that helps you put it all together. It's a pretty common story in Chinese you know, martial arts. Most most people don't learn just from one guy, right? Doesn't matter. Like you, you might only may, name right. one person because that's your sort of yeah, that's your teacher. But, you know, everybody has 10 to 20 people probably along the way that they learn little bits from here or little bits from right. there. And, and everyone, if you meet a good teacher or fighter, you always learn something, you know, depending on the skill of the person, you might only spend a month with somebody and you might learn more from right. that person than you do from everyone else. Right. And there's so, also some about Bagua itself that it seems to be sort of this secondary school for because the famous story is that Dong Ai Chuan would only teach experts. Bagua was never meant to be taught from the beginning. You've got to have this solid foundation. Later, stuff was added to give you the ability to build it up from the start, but uh, there's something well, to be said well, for we, that. Yeah, almost every, I mean, true tradition of Bagua, they will start out by saying Bagua is not a form, it is a system of change. And then they teach you a bunch of forms. Right. But, but, but the first part of it is, you know, first I got to understand that the forms are just a vehicle to get you to this place of change, right? And that if you already have a certain amount of skill in a martial art, if, if you can morph the Bagua philosophy, the Bagua way, if you will, into that, it's just going to save the person a lot of time, right? So what Deng Hai Chuan did supposedly was, you know, with each individual, take the thing they knew and he would base it around that. Now, does anyone nowadays have that level of skill? I doubt it. And that's why we use the forms because the forms are our guideline for some way to get close to that, right? Right. So looking a little further into the end of uh, the life of Zhang Zhaodong and his... Uh, on, uh, after Han Musha beat the Russian strongman, he became very arrogant. On one occasion, he came to where Zhang was teaching and wanted to practice sparring. As they were practicing, Han kept pressing the attacks and backed Zhang Zhaodong against a wall. When he realized that Han's intention was to see if he was now good enough to really beat his teacher, he turned his uh -oh. defense into an attack and knocked Han Musha to the floor. After uh -oh. this incident, the two were bitter enemies, and Han would not admit that he had ever even learned much from Zhang Zhaodong. It is said that he fabricated his own Bagua and told everyone he learned it from a Taoist named Ying. 
Therefore, the Bagua that was taught by Han may appear quite different than that is taught by Zhang Zhaodong. So that sounds like one of those inevitable and unfortunate fallings outs that's, that seems to be 90% of all teachers and their students eventually have a showdown, whether it's over money or fame or just ego or whatever. Yeah. It just has to end up happening. I think the highest level of being a martial artist on that level is both as a student and as a teacher knowing when it's time to walk away right like um if you're fortunate enough to have a teacher who's around long enough to give you the whole thing the best thing you can do is say thank you and uh see you on the other side like because if you stick around too long you are going to get to that point where you're, you start questioning yeah could i take this guy <laughs> and and <laughs> you know and it's just a natural thing when and very few martial artists are going to go, sure, I'll let you win this time, right. you know? Um, as Lee says, you know, martial artists are an arrogant bunch, right? And so even old martial artists don't like to lose. And right. part, of, part of being a mature adult is, like I said, is being able to graciously walk away when it's time to walk away. And to not, as the teacher, not get pissed off if somebody says it's time for me to walk away. People get attached to it, and act like students are sort of like their children mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. And, and that if they, you know, if they leave, it's some sort of betrayal. And it's like, no, he's paying you to teach you. Like, that's all it is. Like, you can, you can layer a relationship on top of that. But at the end of the day, it's a transactional thing. I'm, you're paying me i'm teaching you something well and even for child and parent relationships your goal is for them to go off on their own so you know you have to exactly. have the maturity to see that happen no matter how close like, the relationship i was saying this the other night to one of my students or a bunch of my students that the best thing that could happen from my perspective is one of you guys punch me in the face because that means you've got it, you know, and, and if you can beat me, then I, you know, my job is done and it's time for you to move on. But until that happens, we still got work to do. Um, but, but that, but, but the ego part of either not being able to say, I learned it from this guy and we don't get along anymore. Or to say that guy never studied with me, I think is kind of bullshit. And that happens a lot in martial arts. You deny you learn from somebody that you train with for 30 years. I think that's that to me is disingenuous on a really high level. Likewise, if somebody's your student for five or 10 years and you pretend like they never walk through your door, yeah. now, come on, you know, like, so I think a lot of it is just um, people trying to save face. And it's human beings being human beings mostly and it's sort of like martial artists aren't different in that sense any you know group dynamic is going to have this kind of stuff so it just happens you know? how it goes it's just with martial artists it's a better story because it usually ends in somebody getting their ass kicked so you're like oh that's exciting that's yeah. some action involved. that's right. a positive yeah well that ends this episode All for right. now Hey folks, Isaac here. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Take a look at the Instagram. Leave us a review on iTunes and take care of yourself.